started. How, how about we kind of get up or move around and say hello to those around us? For some of us, we don't get to see each other. Hey, um, I know some people say it's a little cold out there. I love it. I, uh, it's a reminder that, um, you know, it's, it feels very liberating. Um, so uh, bear with us. Um, but let's turn to our passage this morning. It comes from Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 12, and we'll go to chapter 2 through 2. So let's go to Song, Songs of Solomon. Chapter 1, <clears throat> and the word of the Lord says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engadi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together, and we hope, Lord God, wherever we are, Emotionally, mentally, physically, there is a longing for you. And Lord God, we could truly uh, understand that regardless of how we may feel about you, your love for us is ever constant, hasn't changed. No matter how far or how near, there is this long love relationship you desire from us. So, Lord God, if any of us are struggling with any area in our relationship with you, allow us, Lord God, to experience the joy of thy salvation, a reminder how awesome you are. And, Lord God, I hope, Lord, that as people are, are here or there, as they travel, as they come back and forth, You'll guide them back safely. And Lord, may this fellowship, may this church really be a beacon for the neighborhood, for those co-workers around us, friends and family. May our faith be a beacon of hope at times when it's so dark. So Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I, I'm going to need your patience this morning and maybe some of your involvement uh, if you don't know, this Friday is Valentine's Day, all right? I know some of you are like, oh, no. Oh, I better, I better order those uh, roses from Costco. Um, so uh, I'm going to, let's play a little game. I'm going to play, I'm going I'm to show you the lyrics of three love songs that you're going to hear this Valentine. And I want you to tell me. Which one they are. Okay, title and whoever. Ready? Here we go. Who knows this song? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, can you sing for us? <laughs> yes. Um, then if you don't sing it, I'm going to sing it. Okay. Heart beats fast. Okay. Um, all right. Excellent. All right. Okay. Some of you who never heard this song before. Never? All right, okay. Next song. Here we go. <laughs> Who knows this song? And the name of the song. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Excellent. I found a love for me. Okay, I'm sorry. I actually practiced that last night. Uh, <laughs> it is called Perfect by Ed Sheeran. 
You know, it, it, is, it, it is like a kind of a, you know, it's, it's a sweet song. All right. Here you go. I hope life treats you kind. And I hope you have all you've dreamed of. And I wish to you joy and happiness. But above all this, I wish you love. Who? And what's the name of the song? I will always love you. Oh, come on. Who in the 40s should know this song? I will always love you. <laughs> you know, um, I, I know we, we're, these songs, there's tons of these love songs, and you're going to hear it this week, right? There are many ways to express love. There are love stories. You know, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Where art thou, Juliet? Where art thou? Right? I don't think they read that anymore in high school because it's too, like, ooh. There are movies. Beauty and the Beast. Love Actually. And my favorite, Fifty First Dates. That's one of my favorite love movies. And don't forget Titanic, right? There's Rose, Leonardo DiCaprio. And again, songs like this. I will always love you. Unforgettable. We belong together, right? And, and, you know, and for the sports fans, we are the champions. Those are great love songs. And there are a lot of these love songs, movies, stories, that tries to communicate this idea of love. And we are going to try to like, understand the idea of love. From God. Yes. We are continue to understand God by looking at the communicable attributes of God. And this morning, we are going to look at how God tries to love us and explain love. Because what every human being must understand when we hear, quote, unquote, God is love, is that how God loves us cannot be translated or explained fully. Okay, think about this. God, in his ways, tries to love us, tries to communicate to us. What is that? Right? For instance, try to describe the smell of the fruit called durian. Describe it. Some people will say, oh, it smells like a, like a bitter sweet. Some people will say it smells like a skunk. I just died. Like, it, it's difficult to put words even into that. Ask Johan when he tries to translate Indonesian biblical words to English. Those who come to uh, a combined worship, I love it when, he, when Johan looks, goes, what, 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 what's that word? And someone in the audience goes, victory. It means victory. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's hard. There are words, there are thoughts that are hard to translate from one language to another. Imagine God trying to communicate his thoughts, his will, into the human language. And when he does that, the I, term is called anthropomorphic language. Ooh, that one. Okay? SAT word? I don't think they use it because it's, it's probably like graduate work, okay? Anthropomorphic language, which means language that speaks of God in human terms. All right? God is trying to translate his thoughts and feelings into a language we can understand. Again, this is... It is difficult enough translating Indonesian to English. There are Korean words that do not do justice when it's translated to English. How much harder for God thoughts, his will, to human words? I, I think there are Indonesian words that it, it doesn't translate really well. Korean words that doesn't translate well. There's a, there's a word 
called uh, in Korean called punagi. Do you? Oh yeah, there's a couple. There's a couple, right? Right. It talks about like, oh, it's the right atmosphere or feeling, right? It just doesn't do justice. So like, oh, like, let's have the right like Korean punagi, right? I was like, oh yeah, that's, like, that that really sets the room. How I should feel. How I should look. It just doesn't just, just do justice. So God is trying to use scripture to describe not only his love for us, but how love should be. Because our love is from human relationships, which is based upon human beings who are sinful, trying to love in a pure way. There's going to be fault. There's going to be, oh, it doesn't quite work. So God gives us scripture to give us understanding in his love for us and how we should love. So I want to I want to share this morning with you one of the most passionate books in the Bible. And these are love poems given by God which was written by King Solomon to his bride. And some of these words are really graphic. Right? I I'm glad we don't have like any like elementary kids or even middle school kids here. <laughs> oh, did he just say Rest. Right, right, right? Like they'll be like, they'll be, they'll be like laughing. But there is an intimacy. There is an openness. It is really passionate. It is graphic. And if it's taken the wrong way or misunderstood, it, it could be like mistaken for one of those cheap pop songs with suggestive lyrics. But these words are a series of poems that speak what human beings desire. And genuine love. A love that is amazing, that should be never mistaken for something that's simple, it's like a simple desire of the flesh. And I love what, um, this quote. Dr. Child, um, uh, he's a professor of Old Testament. Songs of Solomon is a wisdom reflection on the joy and the mysterious nature of love between a man and women within the institution of marriage. I also want to add that this is also a description, Songs of Solomon, of how God feels about us. And as God has given us love, it is one part intellectually or mind, but there's also has to be this question of like, does it make sense, right? Intellectually, does it make sense? But just as importantly, love should be emotional. It should have passion. But not a passion that just kind of like fades away, but an everlasting passion. And that's what God has for us. He has an everlasting passion. So here we are. Here's a, a man and a woman declaring the love for each other. And in some of your Bibles, if you look at, if you look at songs of Solomon, it, it was Love. It may say he or she. It may say bride. It will say groom. Okay? And, and, and which really indicates man or woman, husband or wife. There is this dialogue. And in verse 12, we read about the woman describing how close she is and near to her husband. While the king was on his couch, and it says, my nard, which is my perfume. Gave forth its fragrance. My beloved to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breast. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards in Gadi. And what, what she's describing is the smell. The smell of, of, of my beloved. He is talking about the senses and how those senses are drawing the attention. Of her husband. And he says in verse 13, the smell or the aroma of him is so sweet and distinctive, like the smell of myrrh and sweet henna, which is associated with love. She states that there's no smell like it. There's nothing that can be mistaken for it. It is unique and special, just like he is special to me. And that's what scents and smells are doing to each other. It's invoking. 
It's invoking, it is reigniting the deep passions for each other. I'm pretty sure uh, you ladies and men, you wear a lotion or a scent or a perfume that's uniquely hers. And maybe it triggers in your mind, oh, I remember my wife rarely ever wears perfume. She wears a certain lotion. And I remember I was walking through Macy's. And I go, ooh, is my wife here? Ooh, right? And I was going through the cosmetics. I was like, oh. oh." Because, like, my immediate reaction was, oh, I smell it. (gasps) Oh, oh, this. Do you want a free sample? That's okay. I better. Right? Like, right? It, it, it automatically triggers it. And that's what, that's what he is talking about. God gives us these words, and, and, and you see this, oh, I, have, I am in love. And a lot of times, smells trigger these passions. And, and here, she is saying, oh, my goodness, there he is. And what does that do? It really ignites. It is a reminder how much the love they have for each other. It is a reminder how they feel about each other. These thoughts, these feelings, it tells the reader that they genuinely, genuinely care for each other. They genuinely are in love with each other. And that's what God is telling about his love for us. When we are near God, when there is a closeness to God, we will experience his love. Just like we read, when they are near, the nearness to God, it will ignite in us, oh, yes, the love of God, the power of God, the intimacy God that I have with them. And that's why God says, be near me. Come near me, because when we are near intellectually, emotionally, we really experience the power of God's love. We are reminded that God is worth loving. And one of the great things about experiencing and being deep in God's love, it removes, or at, at the very least, temporarily minimizes the curse of sin. Let me explain. When you are in a relationship, husband and wife, you remember when you were dating? Like nothing existed. It was just her. <sighs> like being in that relationship at that moment when you are in love, you didn't think about, oh my goodness, I'm so short. Oh, I'm so fat. My hair is not so straight. My skin is not so perfect. You are in that state of love. And when you are immersed in God's love, the curse of insecurities is all gone. The curse of insecurity. When you are loved and there is a reassurance of love, you don't think about, oh, what you lack. Because perfect love drives out fear and the curse of sin. And that is the beauty of being in love. I will be very honest with you. I am not the best looking guy in the world. I know, I know. Some of you are shocked. Right? Some of you are like, well, no, no, Pastor, you're the best looking guy in the world. <laughs> okay, all right? I know I'm not. But when I'm with my wife, I don't feel insecure. I don't feel ugly. I don't feel too short or too brown. I don't don't look at my hair and go, oh, my goodness, look at my hair. That's horrible. Because true love drives out the curse of sin. And it's beautiful. Right? And how many of us are insecure? The, the answer is almost everyone. There's always something that we feel a little bit insecure about. I'm not, I'm not tall enough. Oh, I don't have enough degrees. I didn't go to Harvard. 
or I'm not a, a, a model, I'm not a, a stunning looking actor, I am not athletic, so on and so on. We're always saying there's something that I don't measure up to. And God says to us, when you are near me, the curse of that sin of insecurity and feeling that you're not worthy, God says, I erase it. I erase it. Be in my love. Be in my love. And wow, I feel beautiful. I feel wonderful. I feel I am worthy. And that's what God is telling us. He is informing us how passionate he is for us. He is so passionate for us. That, that, that passion for us just drenches us with such love where you go, oh, man, I'm worth loving. I am worthy. I don't, let's use the language, I am not so ugly. He is so passionately in love with you. He doesn't care if your, your perm came out bad. He loves you. I think I've uh, shared this with you. My first date with Hedgen, <clears throat> it was April of 1995. I remember vividly. Vividly, she doesn't. But she, I remember vividly that date. I know she wore. She wore these loafers that was like a dark navy color, navy socks, guest jeans, blue and white striped sweater, she had a, a kind of a blazer. She wore this necklace with the little beads. It was a special night, our first date. We went to Cafe Diana in Pasadena. She had the Diana salad. I had, I had no idea what I ordered. I have no idea. I, I, I think I had just like bread and water. You know, like, ooh, this is amazing. <laughs> After two hours of, I, I don't know what happened. I, I were driving back. I let her know that this, our first date was wonderful, and I want to marry you. I told her that. I, I want to marry you. We're going to be married. Uh, she did not jump out of the car, which was good. Now, when I said that, there was a feeling of vulnerability. I was scared. But love does crazy things, right? So we've been married 23 years. But every time I saw that sweater or that jacket, it brought back memories about that date, about that night, about that moment. And as a reminder, oh, wow, we have something really good. We have something special. So it was kind of sad that um, one day we were cleaning out our, our, her closet, and she said, oh this, oh, this sweater, the one that she wore on that date, oh, it's it, like, and there was like a couple holes. Like, it looked like moth ate it. She goes, oh, I think I should throw this away. I went, no, don't throw it away. She goes, why? It's, it's old, and it's, look, look, it has holes in it. And I'm like, Okay, because <laughs> right. it was a reminder of our relationship that night. So I said, "Okay," you know. Then I, I, I kind of grabbed it. And I, oh, okay, I'm ready to let it go. That's what that's what we were reading right now. Verse twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. The smell. Oh, it's a reminder of what God has given to us, this relationship. It's invoking the love and passion they have for each other. And, and, and when we're in the midst of that love, when people are in love, memories of each other are sweet and wonderful. And these verses is a message that we really love each other. And when we love each other, it's amazing what happens. And God is telling us, that's how I feel about you. When you crack open the Bible, 
God saying, oh, okay, all right. When you come to me in prayer, all right. It is a reminder. It is, it is the reigniting, the reconnecting. And God says, oh, I love you. Come back into my love. Now the question is, what makes this love so good and powerful? Here we go. Then the man responds by stating how beautiful she is. King Solomon is, is a king. He is the beloved or the, the man, the husband. He could have any, any woman he wants. He could have had the most physically attractive woman in the entire kingdom. But what makes this love so powerful and so good is that word naim. Why does he love her and call her beautiful and he is supposedly handsome? Why are they so deeply in love? In verse 15 and 16, it talks about, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doved. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. The Hebrew word is naim, when it says beautiful. But he's not talking about the, 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 the physical beauty. The word is naim, not as in like you are handsome or you are stunning. But it really talks about intrinsic beauty, the inner glow. And that's what makes this, this love story so amazing because the physical fades away but the heart grows stronger I know it's shocking to believe this but those who are in the mid-20s you will change physically I hate to say it, for the worse <laughs> you're all laughing because no it's true those who are laughing are those who are 40s and 50s you will change for the worse physically. I started to develop a little limp. I don't always walk straight. I, I know this is hard to believe, but I have actually like added some weight. I can't get rid of. We develop physically for the worse. But our heart our mind gets better. Our heart, our mind, our soul gets better. We, could, we are more wise, we are more loving, we are more giving, we are more patient. And anyone that has had parents before you had kids, compared to now, you are much more patient. You have to be. Because those dirty, rotten scoundrels drive you crazy. You have to be more patient. Okay, sure, sure, yeah. Be it little ones or older ones. You grow to be more gracious, more loving. And I love that word, long-suffering. We endure. And we can become better for it. And that's why it's so beautiful, because he says, you are naive, not like you are pretty or you are handsome, but he looks inside of you and says, oh, I see your inner intrinsic beauty, the inner glow, the beauty that is within, it, it flows out. Because if it's just about muscles, it's about high cheekbones, your skin texture, so on and so on. Relations don't last. If it's about how many degrees you have, where you went to school, what kind of car you drive, or how luscious your home is, that too will fade away. But the inner glow, the intrinsic beauty is beautiful, and it gets better. I could say without a doubt, that I love my wife more now than I did 20 years ago. Not because she has grown more younger or more luscious, but I have loved her inner beauty 
and admit it, she has pretty good inner beauty. And she's kind of cute, too. So that kind of helps. <laughs> but we are looking at the very aspect of how God sees us. God looks at us and says, I see your heart. I see your soul. I see your mind. Yes. 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 For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. God looks at your heart. God looks at your mind. God looks at your soul. Matthew 15, 18 says, But the things that come out of the mouth comes from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what makes a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. He's really talking about the heart. He loves our heart. He wants our soul. He wants to educate our our minds. That's love, intrinsic beauty, which is inside. So for you single guys, it is fruitless to search for the most beautiful woman to marry. It's fruitless. Because I already married her. Ha <laughs> ha. But I also believe that every, every married man here would disagree with me. They will say their wife is equally beautiful. That is why it is fruitless to seek the most beautiful woman. Because your beautiful wife to be is beautiful to you. In my hundreds of doing uh, marital counseling, premarital counseling, I've never heard a, 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 a woman say to me, you know, he's really smart, but he is just ugly. So I'm going to marry him anyway because I like his mind. No. I've never heard a, a man say, oh, man, she is, it is stunning, but she is dumb. No, I've never heard that. You know how like, like middle school you guys say that? What would you choose, beauty or, or brains? Every husband-to-be looks at her and says, wow, wow. And that's what I believe every married man here will form. That's right. Because beauty goes beyond the flesh to our soul, mind, and heart. And we grow to be more beautiful. And that's what we were reading. I love you. 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 You are beautiful. Because I see the inner beauty, the intrinsic beauty, the inner glow. If someone says, I love God but hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So his idea of love is, again, it is not the superficial. It is not the physical. It is not the outside stuff. But it is the deep, intrinsic beauty, the inner stuff. So why do you love God? It is because he is handsome? No. Because of his eyes? No. We love God. We love Jesus because of who God is is not what they look like you love god because of who he is so if you're looking to grow in the lord immerse yourself in him and you will grow when you are near him the glow of him will cause you to reignite that passion you have for god The second thing that these verses tell us, why they are deeply in love. Verse 16 and 17, behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green. Our house, uh, the beam of our house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And he's really talking about the idea of it is special. Our bed is perfect. It's luxurious. I never want to leave. I want to be with you all the time on our couch, on our bed, in our home. I want to cradle. I want to cuddle. I don't want to leave. 
because spending time together is so priceless. All right? God tells us in verse 16 and 17, he refers to him as my darling. She refers to him as my love. The Hebrew word is dodi. Both these words that he uses talking about darling or my love, the root word is friend. Both in the feminine and masculine sense. God tells us how much he loves us. There is passion. There is longing. But there is also a component of friendship. God tells us he wants to spend time. The guys kind of understand this, right? Guys, we have our buddies. Our entourage. Our homies, right? <coughs> All right, like when I was younger, I'd say, Yo, what's up, homes? What's up? Okay, we would say that because they were my buddies. We could say anything and do anything together, right? Even the stupidest things. We should like jump from one house's roof to another house's roof because we think that was fun and exciting. How stupid is that? But we were buddies. We did it together. Women are a lot smarter than that. They don't jump roof to roof. They just laugh at us. But when we have our buddies, we could, we, could, we could be together. We could talk about anything. We could say anything. And sometimes it's rude. It's offensive. And we go, shut up. But that's what buddies do, right? Well, that's another component of the relationship God has with us. He also wants to love you. He wants to embrace you. But he also wants to be your friend. He wants to be your buddy. Speak your mind. Let's hang out. He wants to have that kind of relationship as well. Let's enjoy our company together. When it talks about the idea, behold, I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you like we are buddies. Or you know, like women, you know, they'll go have tea together, coffee together, have lunch, right? Spend three hours. Oh, my gosh, where did the time fly? I got to go, go pick up my kids. You can immerse yourself in, that, in that, that, that fellowship, that conversation. How sweet is that? And that's what God is telling us about his relationship, his longing for us. Wouldn't it be great if we could just hang out? Wouldn't it be great if we could just be best friends? And that's, that's what we're reading here. In the Songs of Solomon, the husband turns to his wife, and the wife turns to his wife and is like, oh, man, you're my best friend. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Like literally saying, oh, you're my best friend. Ah, shut up, you. Hit each other on the shoulder. Ha, 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 ha. I, I just, I Google, I, I kind of Googled this. Uh, friendship. Friendship. I Googled it. And it's a term used to denote cooperative and supportive behavior. I was like, oh, oh that's pretty good. The term conno, uh, connotation, connotation is a relationship which involves mutual knowledge, esteem, affection, and respect. Friendship will welcome each other's company and exhibit loyalty towards each other. That's what God wants. A relationship based upon loyalty, affection, knowledge. And here God tells us, come and we'll be immersed in together. Come and we could have deep love for each other. Let me close with this uh, little thing that I read. If anyone has been to Florida, or maybe my parents live in a place called Leisure World. It's a retirement community. I think some of you know where Leisure World is, right? Maybe some of your parents, okay? Uh, go there during, like, daytime. Don't go at night because old people don't go out at night, okay? They're sleeping by, like, 8 o'clock. You go during the afternoon, and it's, it's really cute. You see these old men with their, like, you know, like gray hair, 
shuffling along. And I'm not talking about dancing shuffling. I'm talking like slowly walking along with their wife, walking down the sidewalk, holding hands. It's super cute. Like they're not moving very fast, but they're moving. Like click, 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 right? Or you can see them on the porches that they're reading the newspaper. They have their magnifying, you know, like, like lenses, you know. They're in their old women dresses, and the men are dressed in their, like, those, like, 1970 attire. There they are. They tore it off. They, like, they walk slowly down the street to their to the residence. Maybe they go inside, take a nap for an hour or two, watch television, eat the same food they've always been eating. They will watch television because they don't know about YouTube. They know what each other is thinking by simply a look. Are you angry today? How did you know? I could just tell. And they, when they go to bed, it's the same routine. Maybe they'll have a nice good argument that day. Just to prove that they really care for each other. And through the night, they will snore. Just ripping a snore, like, right? And they don't care because they're so used to it. But they'll wake up, and they'll still be in love. And sometimes they may not always be so loving But in reality, they do. They survived. They survived life. And they've out-hustled the pitfalls of this world. And they continue to love, even though they may have failed. And that's what God is reminding us. Love. Love. And overcome. To grow old together. And that is what is beautiful about God communicating love to us. It is not how only we love each other, but how God loves us. So when God says God is love, remember, the closer we are to him, the more we feel and experience the power Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know.